If thou should call me to resign, what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what is thine. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be Welcome to the third and final night of the best Civil War story. Tonight, we tell the story of something sacred, the home. Tis a sigh that is wafted across the troubled wave. Tis a wail that is heard upon the shore. Tis a dirge that is murmured around the lowly grave. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. July 17th to 19th, 1864. The three burnings. David Hunter torches Hunter Hill, Fountain Rock, and Bedford while their families watch and become homeless. Sunday, July 17th, an order arrived from Washington. Colonel Strother wrote in his diary, received a telegram from General Halleck informing General Hunter to follow the enemy to Chancellorsville if practicable and then fall back if forced towards Washington. He was to devastate the valley south of the railroad as far as the crows flying over would have to carry their knapsack. The exact wording of this order was, Captain Martindale, 1st New York Lincoln Cavalry, will proceed with cavalry under his command to Charlestown, by then West Virginia, and burn the dwelling house and outbuildings of Andrew Hunter, not permitting anything to be taken therefrom except the family. Sunday, July 17, 1864, the Charlestown home of Andrew Hunter's family is burned by these orders. 14-year-old Richard D. Rutherford, whose family lived on Washington Street and a very short walk from the home of Andrew Hunter's family, wrote later. General Hunter had been in command in the valley before Sheridan came. One Sunday, July 17th, the day the order was given to burn the Hunter home, we were all at the Presbyterian Church on Washington Street, except my father, who had stayed home. Some 10 or 15 of Baylor's boys had come into town and all seemed quiet and peaceful, so some had ventured to join us in church. The minister was in the midst of his sermon when we were startled by several shouts out front. All made a rush to get the soldiers out first. A squad of Yankees had passed, shooting at some of our boys who were visiting at their homes, but who had fled at the first alarm of the picket. Those at church had their horses tied behind the church and so succeeded in getting away over the fence in the rear before the main body of Yankees got as far as the church. One of our men, 
Nathan Sadler, who was a friend of my father's, had left his horse downtown and walked up to see my father. They were sitting on the porch talking when the Yankees dashed by. My father put Newton up in the attic right under a slate roof. And as it was very warm through the day, he almost roasted to death. My sister took him ice water often throughout the day, which enabled him to survive his imprisonment. The Yankees had come from General Hunter to burn Andrew Hunter's home. They were first cousins, and General Hunter, I was afterward told, had on a very handsome ring which Andrew Hunter had given him before the war. Mr. Hunter was at home at the time, but they caught him and brought him to our house where his daughters were, so now we were in a tight place with Mr. Hunter and Yankee officers downstairs and Nathan Sadler up in the attic. My mother talked to the officer in command and tried to persuade them not to burn the Hunter house, but to give her time to go to Harper's Ferry to see General Kelly. It was of no use. The men carried great armfuls of hay into each room and put it all to the match. The beautiful home was soon in flames. Nothing was saved but the clothes the family wore. My mother and I, with the help of an old Irishman who lived with us, dragged the piano to the door and would have gotten it out had the soldiers not made us let it alone. When I saw this beautiful home in ruins, I thought no punishment too great for General Hunter. David Hunter Strother continues in his diary. Tuesday, orders given to burn the houses of E. J. Lee and Alex Boatler. Martindale went forth to execute it. July 19, 1864, the burning of the Boatler's home, Fountain Rock, outside of Shepherdstown. Recalled Elizabeth Stockton Pendleton from the recollections of her mother, Tippy Boatler. In the summer of 1864, a corps of 15,000 federal soldiers entered the valley of Virginia and growing crops, railroads, mills, barns, and dwelling houses were destroyed by the order of the commanding general, David Hunter. Among the homes laid in ruins in this campaign was that of Alexander R. Boatler, at that time a member of the Confederate Congress at Richmond. His home, Fountain Rock, was situated a short distance from Shepherdstown. Both armies had passed many times over the farm till there was little left to be taken by the raiders that could have been any use for munitions of war. The house itself, however, with its valuable library, pictures, and furniture, had until then remained uninjured. A magnificent spring of water on the place made it a favorite halting spot for soldiers on the march and situated as it was at the junction of two important roads traversed constantly by Union and Confederate troops. It is no wonder that the little household of women at Fountain Rock passed through many terrible experiences and grew accustomed to dangers and mischiefs and fear of them. I seemed to be with the little group at Fountain Rock on that hot July day. My mother, my widowed Aunt Elizabeth, with her three little children, and Margaret Bunkins, the only servant left upon the place. I see my frail, white-faced aunt looking like death after a severe illness, just creeping about the house. It is easy to recognize my mother in the vigorous, cheerful, charming young girl who has looked after her sister's comfort, minded the babies, cooked the dinner, and at last goes wearily up to her room for a moment's rest. It is all as if I had been there in spirit. The oppressive stillness of the midsummer afternoon, the loneliness of the place, the voice of the Negro woman singing in the laundry room of the spring house, coming faintly up through the lilac hedge to the upper chamber the slight dark-eyed girl brushing out her auburn hair preparatory to her nap. And then, the appearance of my aunt at the door and her startled whisper, don't undress, 
Come with me. A party of Yankees is here. They went down and were met at the end of the front porch by a small band of cavalrymen gathered before the house. The captain dismounted and came forward handing the paper without a word. The two sisters read it together. You are ordered to proceed to the houses of A.R. Boatler and E.J. Lee and to burn everything under cover on both places with their contents. The order was addressed to Captain Martindale of the 1st New York Cavalry and signed David Hunter, Major General, United States Army. As the sisters realized the meaning of the words in the order to burn their beloved home, everything grew black before Helen's eyes until her sister's voice recalled her to her senses. Don't give way, she said. If you give way, I cannot act. And so they immediately separated to save what they could. The mother flew to her children and sent them at once with Margaret Bunkin's child Kitty, a capable young girl, to a safe place under the oaks at some distance from the house. The little ones started off hand in hand. Six-year-old Fanny, in her new flowered hat and her nightdress under her arm, with four-year-old Alexander clinging to her and the baby in the nurse's arms. Well, by this time, the soldiers were scattering all over the place. Mother ran straight up to the garret, followed by several men. And nerved by grief and excitement, she pulled an immense box of linen to the top of the stairs. The box itself, empty, could be moved with difficulty by one person. She asked some of the soldiers to carry it down, and they did so in a kind of dazed confusion of purpose. One man followed her everywhere, trying to help and do everything she asked. Others were only intent on securing things for themselves. Sometimes the soldiers would take up an article. Let that alone, would come the order, and they would hurriedly turn to something else. Going to the pantry, Mother found Captain Martindale looking curiously around. Please put this china here, she said to him, holding up her skirt by the hem so as to make a kind of bag. And he obediently piled in piece after piece of a beautiful new flowered dinner set and other favorite pieces. Why, girl, he said, at last poking her in the belt with his forefinger, your dress will give way there, see? Never mind my dress, but just do as I say, she answered, and he put it in with the rest of the china. In the midst of the hurry and confusion, it was amazing to see one of the men vainly trying to fasten a big Sheffield waiter to his saddle. He turned it every possible way, but the thing was much too large to be adjusted to the situation, and at last he threw it down with an oath. Another soldier was found in a bedroom, trying on a suit of Davis Shepard's clothes. Davis, who had come home from old Capitol prison to die only a few months earlier. Take those off, he was commanded sternly. You may burn them, but you shall never wear them. Well, he jerked off the coat and said, certainly, certainly, in a hurried embarrassment. A quiet young man came up to Mother with a small photograph on porcelain of Murillo's Immaculate Conception. I'm a Christian, he said, crossing himself, and I cannot let this be burned. He was responsible also for the preservation of an old steel engraving, the picture of the interior of Capuchin Monastery with the monks at their devotions. Aunt Elizabeth saved Grandfather Stockton's picture and some other oil portraits and a few things for the children and bundles of her father's papers. But the soldiers threw her baby's cradle back into the flames and one of them kicked a hole in a toilet pitcher she had carried down the stairs. The soldier's task of fire in the house was soon accomplished. The chairs were piled up in the center of the rooms and some combustible fluid poured over them, and the men ran about from place to place with lighted brooms, setting them ablaze. Made to burn the spring house proved useless, for the damp mossy roof and the stone walls were not very combustible material. It burned so slowly that but by the time the soldiers left, 
Only a small hole had been made in the roof, and the boys from town put it out quite effectively. The library building, containing thousands of volumes and many valuable papers, autograph letters and curios, was set on fire last, and the townspeople who gathered on the scene tried to save some of the contents. Unfortunately, they selected handsomely bound presentation volumes and books of little interest for preservation, judging them by their size and dress to be the most valuable books. Aunt Hannah's cottage and the two smaller cabins where the family servants had lived were also entirely destroyed. Up to the last moment, the sisters were absorbed in the practical business of saving a little store of necessities and a few cherished treasures. But when finally everyone was forced to leave the burning building in a sudden uncontrollable impulse of passionate grief, my mother rushed back into the parlor and touching the keys of her beloved piano for the last farewell to her home. My young mother sang these stanzas of Charlotte Elliott's beautiful hymn. My God, my Father, while I stray Far from my home on life's rough way Oh, teach me from my heart to say Thy will be done Though dark my path and sad my lot Let me be still and murmur not Or breathe the prayer divinely taught Thy will be done Renew my will from day to day Blend it with thine and take away all that now makes it hard to say thy will be done then when on earth i breathe no more the prayer oft mixed with tears before i'll sing upon a happier shore thy will be done one of the soldiers seized her by the shoulder and tried to lead her away into safety, but she pulled away from him and began to sing again. If thou should call me to resign, what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what is thine. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Those soldiers looked at Mother in scared amazement probably thinking her distracted with grief and terror. But with her music books and guitar, she then quickly joined the little group outside, watching the final work of the fire. How often in the vivid story of this wartime tragedy have we pictured that scene? The cluster of white roses hanging over the porch as they were caught one by one in the climbing flames and sent whirling upward, shriveled and broken. The trembling black tracery of the window shutters outlined against the red flame within. And the sound of the clanging piano strings through the roar of the fire as they snapped in the melting heat. July 19th, 1864. Midday. The near burning of the Morgan's home falling springs. Anna Morgan Getzendanner wrote of the experience of the son of Colonel William Augustine Morgan, the then very young Augustine C. Morgan. The day of the Shepherdstown burnings, while roaming through the woods, I, I heard men's voices 
excitedly giving orders, and then a sound as of flames roaring, and soon I perceived the house of our good neighbor, Boatler's Fountain Rock, to be burning. The barn also was afire, and as the roof fell, there was a, a terrible crash which frightened me not a little. This fire was destroying a beautiful southern home, the residence of an officer on General Robert E. Lee's staff. I ran to tell mother, but already she had seen the destruction and had gathered the children and servants into a terrified group, for we feared our home, Falling Springs, would be the next invaded. It was not long when we saw the soldiers in their blue coats rapidly approaching. The foremost man doffed his cap and informed my mother that he held an order issued by General Hunter to destroy and burn our house. We all became panicky with terror, but were permitted to save what we needed most for mother and the children. Almost despairing of saving our home, my mother interviewed the officer and asked if the order was correctly understood. The officer asked if our home were not Bedford. Finding his mistake, he soon apologized and learning that Bedford was an adjoining farm, withdrew his men and repaired at once to the home of a near kinsman of General Lee. Leaving Liza and old Ned to restore our belongings to their proper places, my mother donned her war pockets and taking me by the hand, led me quickly to Bedford. But as the soldiers had preceded us, already their fiendish work had begun. There was little one could do to save anything valuable from destruction. My mother and a daughter of the house in attempting to save a feather bed found their efforts useless as the rear of the bed was burning. So here was another old southern home laid in ashes. I remember it as a long, low house with dormer windows and a spacious portico, its roof supported with columns taken from the old ship Constitution. The home sat high upon a grassy slope and the grounds were terraced to the turnpike. The burning of a house was a terrible thing to me as I stood watching the destruction of the cruel soldiers. They had piled furniture in a central part of the house, sandwiched it with straw, and emptied jugs of kerosene over it all. When the match or torch was applied, the result was indeed a conflagration. Sadly, we returned homeward and found things replaced with but little loss. Henrietta Lee described Bedford, her ancestral home in Shepherdstown. Bedford, a brick residence built on a knoll, had a two-story central portico flanked by rambling wings. The lofty front portico with its soaring pointed roof was supported by four huge white wooden columns whose bases and caps had been carved from the splintered battle-scarred masts of the United States frigate Constitution. Daniel Bedinger, while commandant of the Norfolk Naval Yard, had bought chunks of the historic wood when old Ironsides had been brought there for refitting. One entered from the portico by way of the parlor, a large room furnished with high-backed sofas and chairs, with portraits lining the wall in such a manner to focus attention of a portrait taken from the life of General Washington, wearing gold epaulets. A door led from the parlor into the spacious dining room with a crystal chandelier, imported glassware and silverware, and the spacious, well-stocked library. July 19th, 1864, late afternoon. The burning of the Lee's home, Bedford. It was the afternoon of July the 19th, 1864. Mother had been ill in bed for some days, but on that date she was able to dine with us, and later she came upstairs to my room where I made her take a nap. Harry, then 14 years of age, was the only member of the family home. He had gone to the dairy and with the assistance of two young Negroes had made a freezer of ice cream. At the dinner table, mother had given him permission to do this, provided he did not use up all of the one and only nutmeg to be found on our side of the Potomac. 
no more than one cupful of the last of our sugar. She laughed as she said, how can it be fit to eat? Well, Harry, said I, you bring me a taste of it if it's clean and you wash your hands. So just as mother awoke from her nap, Harry came running up bearing a cup and a saucer, each containing a helping of very presentable ice cream. Mother, I brought each of you a taste of my cream. We thought it so good that maybe you would eat just a little because I made it, you know. Well, mother barely tasted hers, simply to please the boy, but I ate all of mine. Then Harry left us and mother finished her nap. I had been writing a letter on my little mahogany lap desk purchased from the sutler store with money given me at Christmas by mother and purchased after paying a duty of 10%. The cup which had held my cream was on the floor and presently a little mouse crept up to it and dipped his paw into the bottom and licked it much as a child would have done. Well, I was much absorbed in this little performance when Aunt Peggy appeared with a small basket of blackberries she had gathered along the Charlestown Road. And after bemoaning the scarcity of berries, Peggy continued. While I was there, a lot of Yankees came along, more than a dozen, and the captain, he said, Oh, woman, are there any Rebs in Shepherdstown? And what did you say, Peggy? I asked her. Oh, I just told him I don't know anything about it. Then he cussed. And he said, where were the last ones in town? And I said, I told you once, I don't know anything at all about any rebels. Well, then he cussed again and said to the other soldiers, boys, you just go ahead to the edge of town and I'll slowly follow. Then you all can tell me what you can find out. And then he said, pointing to me, that ain't nothing but a damn old C-Sesh Negro anyhow. So they went on to town and I come on to the house because there ain't any berries anywhere and I was afraid they'd take those that if I had if I stayed till they come back from town and I didn't want them Yankees to cuss me anymore and call me names. That nasty poor white trash they are anyhow. I just know, Miss Netta, they're after some kind of deviltry anyhow. Well, with this warning... Aunt Peggy departed, but a few minutes later she burst into my room crying, Oh, oh, Miss Henrietta, Miss Netta, look over to Colonel Boatler's, just look! In less than an hour from the time that the soldiers started their work of destruction, the company was filing down the avenue on its way to Bedford, the home of Edmund Jennings Lee. Just as the soldiers started off, Virginia Benninger and her little brother, Harry, who lived at nearby Poplar Grove, arrived at Fountain Rock, their faces white with distress and sympathy. Go back to your home, Aunt Henrietta. They are coming there next. But the captain interrupted, not before we do, and thus prevented their giving warning to the Lee household. When the squad of men, however, had gone well over the hill, Virginia and Harry ran across the field and reached Bedford first. Mrs. Lee and Netta were just starting on their way to Fountain Rock, but old Sally had brought them word of the burning of the house, and Mrs. Lee had gotten out of sickbed to fly to her friend's home. Those children are all alone, Netta. Their mother is in Baltimore. I must go. Tibby was with us when the Leland was burned in 1856. I must go. And she insisted. But Virginia's frantic gestures made them pause, and when she came panting up and told the others to burn their own loved home, they turned back to the pitiful tasks of saving what they could. A number of Negroes on the place and some of the townspeople dragged out the parlor furniture and then secured Mr. Lee's valuable law papers which were hidden under the parlor floor. But Captain Martindale and his men came up in time to prevent further work. The soldiers were rougher in their behavior than they had been at Fountain Rock, but one man sat down in weary protest against the services required of him 
and declared that he would not lift his finger in such work. The pale-faced soldier who helped the sisters at Fountain Rock, helped at Bedford also, but after all, for the little store of rescued goods made but a pathetic showing for the two homeless families. Mrs. Henrietta Bettinger Lee wrote the following month to her cousin, her exact account. The recipient was likely Benjamin Franklin Bettinger, who lived in Kentucky, with views more northern. August, 1864, my dear friend, according to your earnest request, I will send you an exact account of the burning of my beautiful old home by the United States troops under Captain Martindale of the New York Cavalry, and I perform the task with a sick heart, as you can imagine. The morning of that eventful day was calm and lovely no one dreaming that such dire calamity and mischief was near. I, with Netta, my young daughter, and little son, were all the members of my family at home. About four o'clock in the afternoon, Harry rushed into my sick room saying, Oh, Mama, the Yankees have burned Colonel Boatler's house. And at this startling intelligence, I immediately rose and dressed, resolving to go, if possible, to Colonel Boatler's as there were only two helpless ladies and three very young children there. I reached the yard when I met my niece, Virginia Bedinger. In breathless haste, she told me that she had just come from Fountain Rock, Colonel Boatler's home, to inform me that Colonel Boatler's house was in flames and the federal officers were coming to burn my house also and that she had read the order from General Hunter to that effect. Of course, the scene which followed was one of grief and consternation. In a few moments, the enemy was upon us. I met the captain on the portico when the following conversation took place. Is this Mrs. Lee? The captain asked. It is, I replied. Well, I've come to burn your house. He said so coolly, by order of General Hunter. Here, read the order. Handing at the same time a printed order to burn the house, its content, and all outbuildings, and signed by General David Hunter. Well, surely, I replied, you will not, you cannot execute such a barbarous, infamous order. Do spare this house. It was built by my father, a revolutionary soldier and officer. Oh, have respect for his memory and his deeds, I implore you. Do not burn this home. It is a noble house. Well, Martindale's reply was in those coarse and unfeeling words. Lord woman, you must be a fool. Can I help it? You're old enough to know that. Now I give you ten minutes to take out your clothing. Oh, I saw from his cold, cruel eyes and the iron hardness of his face that there was no more hope for me, and that Father Appeal was useless. What could I do? My mind was too distracted to guide me, and so many memories clustered around my childhood's precious home. I left him and tried to collect some necessary articles, and as I passed my pantry door, Martindale stepped in and seized a decanter, which doubtless he thought contained brandy, but which proved to be blackberry wine. How I did wish it had been drugged with Ipecac. Oh, I think this noble captain would have been sick of that day's work. But don't suppose I include all his men in his heartless acts. No, indeed. For some of the soldiers were far more merciful and noble than their leader, after the house was in full blaze, he turned to my niece, Virginia Bedinger, and said in the most insolent and scoffing tone, Now go in and help yourself. Well, nothing in nature could have been more hard and cruel than that man's whole bearing. Fair 
well, my friends, I'm bound for Canaan. I'm traveling through the wilderness. Your company has been delightful. You who doth leave my mind distressed, I go away behind to leave you. Perhaps never to meet again, but if we never have the pleasure, I hope we'll meet on Canaan's land. A group of friends had hastened to me when they discovered what was going on, and with them I was standing on the lawn, gazing at the awful conflagration for all the outbuildings were burning at the same time. And then, with the most self-important and swaggering step, Martindale approached me and dared to offer me his pity. I scorn your pity, I cried. You talk of pity after such an act as this? It is mockery, indeed. The qualities of mercy and pity are strangers to your heart. But dear, it would make this letter too long to tell you all the burning words that fell from my tongue that day. Let it suffice to say I was warm enough to give it to him in round numbers, I assure you. One lady said to me, What did you say to that man? He went away looking like a whipped dog. Well, he was a whipped dog. But my home, my blessed lovely home, the fire ran from base to dome, and as the all-devouring pitiless flame snapped each wire, the bell of that dear home tolled out its dirge. And what is it now? The blackened walls, the frightful skeleton of what was once so fair looms up against the sky. And the wind, as it sighs around the ruin, whispers, Man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. The trailing vines are scorched and dead. The flowers bloom there no more. And the bright silver stream, which so added to its beauty and grace, glides in its desolation, murmuring a perpetual requiem for that dead home. My painful task is finished, dear friend. How kind and soothing your sympathy is. We are refugeeing now miles away from that scene of sorrow and dismay. What are we to do without a home? And scant of clothing, the future is too dark to penetrate. But he that feedeth the sparrows, and clothed the lilies, and in whom we all trust will, I know, provide. Ever truly and affectionately your friend and cousin, Henrietta. Henrietta's daughter, Netta, also recalled that day. There was one little pale-faced blonde fellow whom I shall never forget. He followed me everywhere trying to help me when he could elude the vigilance of his captain. One incident made me smile in the midst of my grief and terror. I was standing on the eastern end of the long back porch on the servant's side of the house, watching the train of straw just lighted as the flames crept towards me. Well, I stepped back to the pavement and when this young man with eyes full of tears came up to me and he carefully wrapped my heavy fur cape around my shoulders on a hot July day, as I was standing between two blazes, as if it was midwinter and I was cold. Well, possibly I was shivering from nervousness, but both of us looked and smiled and, and I took the cape to add to the armful of clothing I had rescued. Recalled young Augustine Morgan, 
The next day, July 20, two Yankees rode up to our door, one being wounded. His blue coat, open at the throat, showed in the front of his shirt splotches of blood. He moaned with pain while the other soldier supported him. He asked my mother if she would not care for the wounded man who had been shot in the arm. But the maimed soldier proudly protested and insisted that no rebel woman should dress his wound. But my gentle mother quite won him over and I sent for Liza who brought clean linen and fresh water. The arm was finally dressed, bandaged, and the soldier made comfortable. The following day, Mrs. Lee writes a letter of protest to General Hunter, the originator of the order to burn her home a letter which unfortunately for many got into the hands of Confederate General Jubal Early, who took revenge on the town of Chambersburg. The letter has been called by some a masterpiece of sublime invective. She wrote, Jefferson County, July 20th, 1864. General Hunter. Yesterday, your underling, Captain Martindale, of the 1st New York Cavalry, executed your infamous order and burned my house, Bedford. You have had the satisfaction ere this of receiving from him the information that your orders were fulfilled to the letter. I, therefore, a helpless woman whom you have cruelly wronged, address you, a Major General of the United States Army, and demand why this was done. What was my offense? My husband, Edmund Jennings Lee, was absent, an exile. He had never been a politician or in any way engaged in the struggle now going on, his age preventing. The house was built by my father, Lieutenant Daniel Bettinger, a revolutionary soldier who served the whole seven years for your independence. There was I born, and there the sacred dead repose. It was my house and my home. And there was your niece, Miss Griffith, who has tarried among us all this horrid war up to the present time, met with all kindness and hospitality at my hands. Was it for this that you turned me, my young daughter and little son, out upon the world without a shelter? Or was it because my husband is the grandson of the revolutionary patriot and rebel Richard Henry Lee and the near kinsman of the greatest of generals, Robert E. Lee? You and your government have failed to conquer, subdue, or match him, and your disappointment, rage, and malice find vent on the helpless and inoffensive. Hyena-like, you have torn my heart to pieces, for all hallowed memories clustered around that homestead. And demon-like, you have done it without even the pretext of revenge, for I never saw or harmed you. Your office is to lead, like a brave man and soldier, your men to fight in the ranks of war. But your work has been to separate yourself from all danger and with your incendiary band steal unawares upon helpless women and children to insult and destroy. Two fair homes did you yesterday ruthlessly lay in ashes giving not a moment's warning to the startled inmates of your wicked purpose. Turning mothers and children out of doors, you are execrated by your own men for the cruel work you give them to do. One might as well hope to find mercy and feeling in the heart of a wolf bent on his prey of young lambs as to search for such quality in Martindale's bosom. You have chosen well your agent for such deeds, and doubtless will promote him. 
a colonel of the Federal Army has stated to me that you deprived 40 of your officers of their commands because they refused to carry out your malignant mischief. I say all honor to their names for this at least. They are men. They have human hearts and blush for such a commander. I ask, who that does not wish infamy and disgrace attached to him forever would serve under you? Your name will stand on history's page as the hunter of weak women and innocent children, the hunter to destroy defenseless villages and refined and beautiful homes, to torture afresh the agonized hearts of widows, the hunter with the relentless heart of a wild beast, the face of a fiend and the form of a man. O oh, earth, behold the monster. Can I say, God forgive you? <laughs> no prayer can be offered for you. Were it possible for human lips to raise your name heavenward, angels would thrust the foul thing back again and demons claim their own. The curses of thousands, the scorn of the manly and upright, and the hatred of the true and honorable will follow you and yours through all time and brand your name infamy. Infamy. Again, I demand, why have you burned my home? Answer, as you must answer before the searcher of all hearts. Why have you added this cruel, wicked deed to your many crimes? Signed, Henrietta Bedinger Lee. Mid pleasures and palaces, though I may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. A charm from the sky seems to hallow us there, which seek through the world is ne'er met with elsewhere. Home. Home, sweet, sweet home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. Wednesday night, July 20, 1864, Tippy. Butler wrote to her sisters from the family's second home in Shepherdstown, located today on the northeast corner of Church and New Streets. My precious sisters, well, my darlings, I suppose that you have heard before this reaches you that our dear, beautiful home is in ashes. But we can all of us look back with nothing but pleasure to our home. We had nothing but happiness there. The grounds can and will be kept as beautiful as ever. So when you all come to us in the summer, we can have picnics there. Ah, there is life in the old land yet. They may break. They may burn, but they cannot subdue. Lizzie was home yesterday and says that the head of Alexander the Great, you know that little medallion, is still hanging on the nursery walls. What a life little Fanny has led. Poor child, she will never forget the scenes through which she is passing. She put her little hat on and took her dolls under her arm and the Yankees tore the feather out of that white hat. And one was decking himself out in poor Davis's clothes, but he quickly peeled them off. The barn was the most fearfully grand sight I ever saw. 
The dinner table burned, as it was, and they pocketed the spoons and forks that we were using. Lizzie has just come in and sends her best love to you all. I must go and dress myself, and so must stop. God ever bless you, my darlings, and give you strength to bear this will be the prayer of your devoted sister's heart. Give my warmest love to George and Henry. Ever yours, Tippy. Caroline Danska Dandridge, not yet 10 years old, and the precocious stepsister of George and Virginia Bettinger, was probably home when Henrietta Lee, her aunt, took fresh refuge in their home, Poplar Grove. And after the burning, little Danska wrote, To Hunter, O cruel serpent, king of scorpions thou, curse on thy barbarous act. May never the goddess of pity send her smile upon thy blasted heart. Behold on yonder verdant hill a house once stood. It was the house of love, of peace and glee. How soon that home was rendered desolate. By whom? O oh, hunter, t'was by thee. Refugeeing. The homeless boatlers and lees seek shelter and support. After the burnings, the boatlers and lees sought refuge with friends wrote Elizabeth Pendleton of her grandparents, mother and Aunt Lizzie's family, much later. Kind neighbors gave shelter for the night, and for many nights afterward until both families were again under a roof of their own. Tippy Boatler and her sister moved into a little house in the village. It was later the Methodist parsonage. Every fair Sunday until she left Shepherdstown, Tippy would take her Bible and go to Fountain Rock to read. There was peace there, even in its desolation. Edwin Gray Lee died in his sleep Wednesday, August 24, 1869. During his slow dying, he wrote of war. Wiser, he wrote, once they sprang to battle's call, as to a revel sound, then war kings. Now, uh, this is all, a nameless, storm-washed mound. Within a year of Edwin's passing, Julia Pendleton Allen, the widow of James W. Allen, died, leaving behind a young son. The wages of war had gathered upon her. 1867, John Eston Cook revisits the Bower just once more and sees fonder former scenes. In the summer of 1867, I revisited the old hall where those summer days of 1863 had passed in mirth and enjoyment. And then I, I wandered away to the grassy knoll where Stewart's Oak still stands. The side of that Great tree brought back a whole world of memories. Seated on one of its huge roots beneath the, the dome of foliage just touched by the finger of autumn, I seem to see all the past rise up again and move before me with its gallant figures, its bright scenes and brighter eyes. <laughs> Alas, those days were dust and Stuart sang and laughed no more. The grass was green again and the birds were singing, but no martial forms moved there, no battle flag rippled, no voice was heard. Stuart was dead, his sword rusting under the dry leaves of Hollywood Cemetery and his battle flag was furled forever. That hour under the old oak in the autumn of 1867 was one of the saddest that I have ever spent. The hall was, was there as before, the clouds floated, the stream murmured, the, the wind sighed in the great tree as when Stuart's tent shone under it. But the splendor, 
had vanished. The laughter had hushed. It was a, a company of ghosts that gathered around me, and their faint voices sounded from another world. Tippy Bowler's 1872 Christmas with her family. And Tippy describes Christmas for her mother from the home of Dudley's parents. Wife County, December 29, 1872, Sunday morning. My own darling Ma, this last letter which I shall write this year will, I hope, reach in time to give a New Year greeting from your faraway child. It will be almost entirely about myself and my surroundings and prospects. I hope it may relieve your mind of its anxieties concerning me so that the new year may not be clouded by thoughts of me. May it be bright and happy one to you and all you love is the prayer of my heart. Let me tell you how our Christmas was spent. Three happier, more delighted children you never saw, and I was fully repaid for any trouble I might have taken to make them so. Their three little stockings were hung at the foot of their bed and were the first pleasure before daylight, Christmas morning. And then the coming downstairs and the tree and the baby house. Thanks to Pa for the number of hearth and home from which I got the patterns and so was able to make some beautiful furniture. The box was divided into two rooms and papered within and without. The London dolls dressed in the latest style. And Dudley made a nice bedstead and Kenneth sent Helen and Alice each a set of tea things. The tree was very pretty. Popcorn colored papers on the sugar plums and the paper dolls make it very pretty. Father and mother came over and dined with us. The dinner was turkey a present from father, a spiced ham and corn and tomatoes and potatoes, etc., etc., plum pudding, peaches, and tangle breeches. August 10, 1877. Edmund Jennings Lee, the husband of Henrietta and father to Netta, Edwin, Edmund, and Harry dies. February 1880, 65-year-old Abram Dixon, who worked for the Bettingers at Poplar Grove during the war and after, a freedman, is killed in a tree accident. August 10th, 1880. Henrietta Bettinger Lee, widowed and now living at her home, Leland, in Shepherdstown, writes to herself. Anniversary of my beloved husband's death, three years a widow. The first dream I had after his death was short and brief, and oh, so comforting. <laughs> he came to me and said, come with me, and I will show you something beautiful. November 6th, 1880, the Lees' burned-out home, Bedford and its property, is put up for sale. The Lees lived in Leland, their rebuilt home on the old Philadelphia Wagon Road, which is today 480. Anxiously, Henrietta writes in her diary. <sighs> November 6th, 1880. The sale is not confirmed, so it is still mine. This day, Bedford, the home and birthplace of my dear father and sisters, as well as myself and two brothers, was sold. It was passed away forever from me. I have shed so many tears in the last ten years that I thought the font was dry. But when my boys came from town and told me Bedford was sold, the sobs came up and my tears gave way. How I had prayed that this portion of the wreck of my poor husband's property might be kept for me. God alone knoweth. 
But it has not pleased my Father in heaven to grant this prayer, and I bow submissively and humbly to his will. No tie of earthly goods remains to keep me united to the world. My grasp upon perishable things is loosened, and my wearisome journey to the end will be easier. Nearer to thee, my God, nearer to thee, even though it be a cross that raiseth me. Thou hast given me the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet thine hand upholdeth me still. Vain man, thy fond pursuits forbear. Repent, thine end is nigh. Death at the farthest can't be far. Oh, think before thou die. November 19, 1880 November winds howl idly by. This evening alone and sadly I turned my footsteps to Bedford. Now Bedford no more. The house and name are dead. As I walk pensively over its once beautiful, now ruined grounds, I wondered what had been the especial sin of my forefathers that thus it was swept away from the earth with such destruction. Scarce one stone upon another to tell it had once been a beautiful, stately habitation of joy and happiness. My grandfather's home and my father's birthplace as well as mine. And my heart asks, who did sin, this man or his father? That their home and memory are swept away from the children of men. Reflect, thou hast a soul to save. Thy sins, how high they mount. What are thy hopes beyond the grave? How stands that dark? Account. Alas, who can tell? Perhaps they reject the way, the truth, and the life, and this is the end. Oh me, lovely homes are given us, but ruin and destruction sometimes follow the gift. I sat me down upon a part of the old foundation and just wept aloud. But not even a Bird heard the sobs as they welled up from my desolate heart. I called to each dear, familiar name of my childhood, but none answered. There was neither a voice nor sound. I stood in the ruin which was once my angel mother's room and called the blessed name of mother, but the cold sky only heard. I put my arms and faded grief-worn cheeks upon every tree. My arms encircled the old decaying trunks, and my cheek pressed to the bark as furrowed and almost as old as the tree. Yet my dear father planted them, and in childhood I rested under their shade. Alas, childhood, what a brief period! Visitations of dark grief and sorrow have been visited upon me, and such a checkered life that I almost am inclined to doubt that I was ever a child. That period is so far away, and the flowing shadows of the present so entirely envelop my existence. Oh, why is it that we so cling to life? From cradle to grave, tears are meted out to us. Has it been so with everyone born on earth? I suppose, for all have sinned, and sin brings sorrow and death. A beloved house is like a mother's bosom. Go far from it, yet you can never forget or cease to love and cling to it. Often I wish I was miles and miles away from my scattered and ruined home, but here it is constantly before my eyes, saddened by what is and what it was. 
thy flesh perhaps thy greatest care shall in to dust consume but our destruction stops not there sin kills beyond the tomb my home is gone swept away by enemies and now an enemy of my husband's has purchased it and it is his as I retraced my sad and long footsteps homeward I knelt upon a cold gray rock the last prayer that shall ever rise to heaven from that spot Lord thy will be done there's nothing now to hold my heart from thee or keep me clinging to this world make me resigned make me satisfied my life is rapidly drawing to its close and the beloved ones oh may we meet on your bright shores no more to part when once we've met Elizabeth Stockton Pendleton, a daughter of Tippies, remembered growing up in the shadow of Fountain Rock and its legend. The old place was, by this time, an ever-grown ruin, exceedingly picturesque and interesting, surrounded by a hedge of orange so high as to shut in all but the tops of the trees from the view of passers-by. The walls of the house remained standing, solid stone masonry built by Dr. Henry Boatler. But only by careful searching could be found traces of the long brick wings which dated back to colonial times. In the sheltered hollows of the foundation under what had been the two-storied front porch, we found every year white and blue violets blossoming long before any other spring flowers could be discovered. We never entered the great hollow, high-raftered main room without a desire to shout or sing. Our voices sounded strangely magnificent, we thought, in that empty water traverse chamber. We never thought of calling our new home by the old name Fountain Rock, a name associated in our minds with all that is romantic and exciting to one's imaginations. Fountain Rock belonged to the past the past we dreamed of after a talk with our mother on long winter evenings. Down at Fountain Rock, we searched for hidden treasure, possibly buried in the mortar and bricks that lay beneath the light soil and overgrowth of grass and weeds and mosses with which the years had covered and beautified them. There we would play at war, battles and retreats, ambuscades and thrilling escapes. The Yankees are mysteriously entirely impersonal enemies behind every tree and lurking in every darkened thicket. Down at Fountain Rock, we learned to know the songbirds intimately and well. There were many in the trees and shrubbery of the old place that we seldom heard among the young maples and fruit trees of our new home. Down at Fountain Rock, we built dams in the stream and often followed its course to distant, sun-warmed pools where we could wade without aching feet. Down at Fountain Rock, we tried to realize a home of ideal loveliness where a little girl whom we knew intimately named Helen Boatler moved in a continual round of interesting happenings. For Fountain Rock, as it had been before and during the war, was the scene of almost every story told us by our mother, whose memory held dear every nook and corner of her childhood's home. It's no wonder that the very name for us had magic in it. But the story that thrilled us more than any other was the burning of the house. And it was a story often asked for by the young friends who visited the home. The story did not always come readily, but a little talk about the place, a few questions answered, 
a reference to some war episode, and soon Mother would be in the midst of the narrative we wanted. I wish I could tell in some way and suggest the vivid realism of her story. Her soft, splendid dark eyes did half the talking for her. Her wonderful voice added special meaning to every word, and a remarkable, half-unconscious power of mimicry made every character mentioned a real personality to us. So real indeed has it become to me that now, after many years, the memory of experiences other than my own home comes back to me with something of the effect of things actually seen, heard, and felt by myself. Fountain Rock has passed into other hands, and the plow has passed over its pleasant places. But we should like to think with dear Ella that, as men when they die do not die all, so their extinguished habitations, there may be a hope, a germ, to be revivified. The Reviled, Franklin G. Martindale, takes his own life. Self-destructive acts have many causes and origins, and while its sources are unknowable, it should be noted that many years later, the same Franklin G. Martindale, while residing at a veteran's home near Los Angeles on the day October 2nd, 1896, died. The cause, according to the official report, strychnine taken with suicidal intent. He was buried in Holmes Cemetery, Section 2, Row 513. October 7, 1898, Henrietta Bettinger Lee dies. Miss Netta, the last surviving witness to the burnings, moves on with grace. A widow lay back, suffering from uremic poisoning, her 88-year-old frame at ease in their Leland home. She died and was buried beside her husband Charles at Mount Olivet Cemetery in nearby Frederick, Maryland. But just the same, and as it should be, the headstones of almost all her family were peeking through a narrow grove of trees at Leland here in Shepherdstown in the adjacent Elmwood Cemetery. Graveside respect was organized for Netta, that last one who was really there at the burning. A square mound of earth among stones, Nettie's precious ones turn home Everything starts again. Daily tasks repeat a recurring theme. The new wind blows, sighs, and cries, knowing it is our song. When the swallows homeward fly, when the roses scattered lie, when from neither hill nor dale chants the silvery nightingale in these words my bleeding heart would to thee its grief impart when i thus thy image lose can i Oh, can I e'er no repose? Can I, oh, can I e'er no repose? This concludes. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Our three-day shared journey into the best Civil War story. Special thanks to Terry Tucker for her musical selections and singing.
and to our reader's first Homer speaker. And, and myself, who is already standing. And Arthur Gilbertson. And we all know that unlike the Butlers and the Lees, you do tonight have a home to go home to. We want to thank John Bloomquist on the sound and lighting, these stalwarts here at the Black Box, <laughs> Black Arts, I know, the Black Box Arts Center for hosting, standing joke, uh, Laura Bacon for making this all happen by asking us to come here, Rob Perks on video, uh, Dean Seiler, these treasures from your papa's attic on German Street, donated them. Have a look over there. And Jan Hafer, who's made everything happen to make us all happy and well fed. <laughs> Thank you very much. I got all that. much. If thou should call me to resign, what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what is thine, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done.
thy fond pursuits forbear repent thine end is nigh death at the farthest can't be far all oh, think before thou swallows homeward fly when the roses scattered lie when from neither hill nor dale chants the silvery nightingale in these words my bleeding heart would to thee its grief impart when I thus thy image lose. Can I, oh, can I ere no repose? Can I, oh, can I ere no repose? This concludes. <laughs> you know what I mean. Our three day shared journey into the best Civil War story. <laughs> Thank you very much. I got it. Thank you very much.